Shari Shalom, everyone, and I'll be beginning a new series called Exodus Lounge Book Reviews. For those of you that's been on the channel long enough, know that I'm a bookworm or I kind of geek out on books. I really enjoy history, anthropology, and books about antiquity. So the first book that I'll be reviewing will be Babylon Mystery Religion. The Holy Bible will still be incorporated within the study and the book will be read chapter by chapter. Hope you all enjoy the review and Shalom. Babylon, source of false religion. The mystery religion of Babylon has been symbolically described in the last book of the Bible as a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Revelations 17, 1 and 6. When the Bible uses symbolic language, a woman can be symbolized as a church. The true church, for example, is likened to a bride, a chaste virgin, a woman without spot or blemish. Ephesians chapter 5, 27, Revelations chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. But in striking contrast to the true church, the woman of our text is spoken of as an unclean woman, a defiled woman, a harlot. If it is correct to apply this symbolism to a church system, it is clear that only a defiled and fallen church could be meant. In big capital letters, the Bible calls her Mystery Babylon. When John wrote the book of Revelations, Babylon as a city had already been destroyed and left in ruins. As the Old Testament prophets had foretold, Isaiah 13, 19 through 22, Jeremiah 51 through 52. But though the city of Babylon was destroyed, religious concepts and customs that originated in Babylon continued on and were well represented in many nations of the world. Just what was the religion of ancient Babylon? How did it all begin? What significance did it hold in modern times? How does it all tie in with what John wrote in the book of Revelations? Turning the pages of time back to the period shortly after the flood, men began to migrate from the east. It all came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the, in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Genesis 11 and 2. And it was in this land of Shinar that the city of Babylon was built, and this land became known as Babylonia, or later as Mesopotamia. Here the Euphrates and Tigris River had built up rich deposits on earth that could produce crops in abundance. But there were certain problems the people faced. For one thing, the land was overrun with wild animals, which were a constant threat to the safety and peace of the inhabitants. Exodus 23, 29, and 30. Obviously, anyone who could successfully provide protection from these wild beasts will receive great acclaim from the people. It was at this point at large, powerfully built men by the name of Nimrod appeared on the scene. He became famous as a mighty hunter against the wild animals. The Bible tells us, and Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahweh Elohim. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yahweh Elohim, Genesis chapter 10, 8 and 9. Apparently, Nimrod's success as a mighty hunter caused him to become famous among those primitive people. He became a mighty one in the earth, a famous leader in worldly affairs. Gaining this prestige, he devised a better means of protection. Instead of constant fighting with wild beasts, why not organize the people into cities surrounding them with walls of protection? Then, why not organize those cities into a kingdom? Evidently, this was the thinking of Nimrod. For the Bible tells us that he organized such a kingdom, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, Kali, in the land of Shinar. Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. The kingdom of Nimrod is first mentioned in the Bible. Whatever advances may have been made by Nimrod would have been well and good, but Nimrod was an ungodly ruler. The name Nimrod comes from Mered and means he rebelled. The expression that he was a mighty one before Yahweh can carry a hostile meaning, the word before, being sometimes used as a meaning against Yahweh Elohim. The Jewish encyclopedia says that Nimrod was he who made all the people rebellious against Yahweh Elohim. The noted historian Josephus wrote, Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of Elohim. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of Elohim. The multitudes were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod, and they built a tower, neither sparing any pains, 
nor being in any degree negligent about the work, and, by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon. Basing his conclusions on information that has come down to us in history, legend, and mythology, Alexander Hislou has written in detail of how Babylonian religion developed around traditions concerning Nimrod, his wife Semiramis, and her child Tammuz. When Nimrod died, according to the old stories, his body was cut into pieces, burnt, and sent to various areas. Similar practices are mentioned even in the Bible, Judges 19 and 29, 1 Samuel 11 and 7. Following his death, which was greatly mourned by the people of Babylon, his wife Semiramis claimed he was now the sun god. Later, when she gave birth to a son, she claimed that her son Tammuz, by name, was their hero Nimrod reborn. The accompanying cut shows the way Tammuz came to be represented in classical art. The mother of Tammuz had probably heard the prophecy of the coming Messiah to be born of a woman, for this truth was known from the earliest times, Genesis 3 and 15. She claimed her son was supernaturally conceived, and that he was the promised seed, the savior. In the religion that developed, however, not only was the child worshipped, but the mother was worshipped also. Much of the Babylonian worship was carried through mysterious symbols. It was a mystery religion. The golden calf, for example, was a symbol of Tammuz, son of the sun god. Since Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, or Baal, fire was considered as his earthly representation. Thus, as we see, candles and ritual fires were lighted in his honor. In other forms, Nimrod was symbolized by sun images, fish, trees, pillars, and animals. Centuries later, Paul gave a description which perfectly fits the course that the people of Babylon followed. When they knew Elohim, they glorified Elohim not as Elohim, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible Elohim into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They changed the true image of Elohim to a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. For this cause, Elohim gave them up to vile affections. Romans 1, 21-26 This system of idolatry spread from Babylon to the nations. For it was from this location that men were scattered over the face of the earth. Genesis 11 and 9 And they went from Babylon and took their worship of the mother and child and the various mystery symbols with them. So let's do some check on learning here. So with the passage is saying that when the Most High confounded the languages of the many nations at the Tower of Babylon, they still developed a language, a language of symbols to still communicate with one another. I'll give you an example, an octagon, a geometrical shape, and it's red. What is it? It's a stop sign, right? So I can still relay a message to you without talking. Another example, triangular in shape, yellow in color, and it has an exclamation point in the middle of it. What is it? The message is caution. All right, let's continue reading. Herodotus, the world traveler and historian of antiquity, witnessed the mystery religion and its rites in numerous countries and mentions how Babylon was the primeval source from which all system of idolatry flowed. Bunton says that the religious system of Egypt was derived from Asia and the primitive empire in Babylon. In his noted work, Nivea and its remains, Layard declares that we have the united testimony of sacred and profane history that idolatry originated in the area of Babylonia, the most ancient of religious systems. All of these historians were quoted by Hislou. When Rome became a world empire, it is a known fact that she assimilated into her system the gods and religions from the various pagan countries over which she ruled. Since Babylon was the source of the paganism of these countries, we can see how the early religion of pagan Rome was but the Babylonian worship that had developed into various forms and under different names in the countries to which it had gone. Bearing this in mind, we notice that during this time when Rome ruled the world, that the true savior, Yahshua HaMashiach, was born, living among men, died, and rose again. He ascended into heaven, sent back the Ruach HaKodesh, and the New Testament church was established in the earth. What glorious days! 
One only has to read the book of Acts to see how much Elohim blessed his people in those days. Multitudes were added to the church, the true church. Great signs and wonders were performed as Elohim confirmed his word with signs following. And I put this next paragraph in the parentheses because it kind of alarmed me. It showed me a symbol and I underlined the words which kind of gave me the red flag. And the author seems to try to be informative about what Christianity is really about. True Christianity, appointed by the Ruach Kakodesh, swept the world like a prairie fire. It encircled the mountains and crossed the oceans. It made kings to tremble and tyrants to fear. It was said of those early Christians that had turned the world upside down. So powerful was their message and spirit. So an encircled cross upside down is a black mass symbol. Before too many years had passed, however, men began to set themselves up as lords over Elohim's people in place of the Ruach HaKodesh, instead of conquering by spiritual means and by truth. As in the early days, men began to substitute their ideas and their methods, attempting to merge paganism into Christianity, were being made even in those days when our New Testament was being written. For Paul mentioned that the mystery of iniquity was already at work, warned, that there would come a falling away, and some would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, the counterfeit doctrines of the pagans. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three, and chapter seven. First Timothy chapter four and verse two. By the time that Jude wrote the book that bears his name, it was necessary for him to exhort, meaning to encourage. It was necessary for him to exhort the people to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. For certain men had crept in who were attempting to substitute things that were no part of the original faith. Jude chapter one, verses three and chapter four. Christianity came face to face with the Babylonian paganism in its various forms that had been established in the Roman empire. The early Christians refused to have anything to do with its customs and beliefs. Much persecution resulted. Many Christians were falsely accused thrown to the lions, burnt at the stake, in other ways tortured and martyred. Then great changes began to be made. The emperor of Rome professed conversion to Christianity. Imperial orders went forth throughout the empire that persecution should cease. Bishops were given high honors. The church began to receive worldly recognition and power. But for all this, a great price had to be paid. Many compromises were made with paganism. Instead of the church being separate from the world, it became part of the world system. The emperor, showing favor, demanded a place of leadership in the church. For in paganism, emperors were believed to be gods. From here on, wholesale mixture of paganism into Christianity were made, especially at Rome. We believe the pages which follow prove it was this mixture that produced the system which is known today as the Roman Catholic Church. We do not doubt that there may be fine, sincere, and devout Catholics it is not our intentions to treat lightly or to ridicule anyone whose beliefs we may here disagree with. Instead, we hope that this book will inspire people, regardless of their church affiliation, to forsake Babylonian doctrines and concepts and seek a return to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. All praises to the Most High, Yahweh Ba'ashem, Yahshua HaMashiach, our High Priest forever. Hope you all enjoyed Chapter 1 Review of Babylon Mystery Religion. Tune in for chapter two and shalom.